Uh, before I start, I just want to say um, I've been doing uh, public art for 35 years now. This is our 35th anniversary at Forecast Public Art. Uh, I've shared some copies of our magazine, Public Art Review. If you need more copies, I have some. And I also have this lovely printed piece that just came off the press last week about Forecast 35 years in the, in the public art field. But before I started Forecast, I actually was uh, um, an artist, a graduate of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and ended up getting a CETA job. I was one of 60 CETA artists, a Comprehensive Employment Training Act. Some of you here may remember the CETA program. It put 60 artists to work in the city of Minneapolis. I was given a desk and a phone at Minneapolis City Hall at the Arts Commission. And I was told that I was gallery director, but there was one catch, there is no gallery. <laughs> so they said, the city is your gallery, and the parks and the plazas and the government centers, and uh, here's your desk and phone. Now arrange for these 60 artists in the program to uh, you know, get their works out there. And artists were paid to work half time in their studios and half time in the community. I thought, this is great. This should happen all the time every year, and this is the federal government doing this. And I'm wondering why that hasn't happened since, you know? Um, years, well, and coming out of it as a sculptor, I realized bureaucracy is, uh, is like found object sculpture. It's an art form as well. And uh, years later, I got the job of arts development manager for the city of St. Paul and uh, was fortunate to have artists uh, design fellows uh, through an NEA grant. So I knew the value of having artists working inside City Hall and working in uh, a collegial and collaborative way with city workers. So this feels like uh, coming full circle back to this group here. And we've got some great questions that these panelists have been asked to consider, like what are the ingredients of building a creative community? And what can cities and state governments do to encourage creative development? And how do we break down the silos and encourage collaborations? And we're going to start with uh, Kip Bergstrom, Bergstrom, then move on to Lynn McCormick, then Aaron Williams, then Gogan Kayim, and, and Marty Potinger. And so really glad to have everybody here. I'm going to ask them to keep their opening remarks brief within about five minutes so that we can have plenty of time for dialogue. Thanks. Kip? Great, can you hear me? Great. So uh, I put a piece on, on your tables uh, that I wrote after the Art Place uh, conference in Miami, um, kind of uh, the provocation for which was a panel like this that I was on there. And um, I'm only gonna cut, touch upon a couple of the points from that, uh, but you have it um, for your reading pleasure if you like. Um, just in response to what Jack said, um, my family originally came from St. Paul, the uh, font of all Swedes, and um, I ran a CETA <laughs> program uh, in my 20s, and we employed a lot of artists, but I have to say that in the um, last year, we did a program called City Canvases, put a million dollars out, and we employed uh, 74 artists, 24 large-scale public art projects, um, two of which won top 50 awards for public art by AFTA. In the WPA, Paint America project, they employed 100 artists in Connecticut. So we almost got to that threshold. So um, the idea of, of, of art, public works is not dead. We're going to bring it back. Um, so a couple thoughts. One is, before there was placemaking, there, before there was creative placemaking, there was placemaking. And I actually prefer the term placemaking. And it's been a term that's been in parlance uh, at least since Jane Jacobs in the urban design and architecture worlds. People know what places are, they know what unplaces are. Uh, one of the differences is um, places are arts infused, but they're also typically history infused. They typically sit in a really good marriage with their landscape. Um, increasingly, there's a focus on 
places that are sustainable, that are water and energy efficient, that are disaster resilient, uh, places that are digitally and transit connected, that are um, empowering of their people. Um, and so in, when I say placemaking, I'm not just talking about creative placemaking and a limited focus on the arts and creative uh, culture sector, but really placemaking in that, that holistic sense. And if art wants to impact placemaking, it has to do so in concert with the folks that are doing those other things, because the, the fabric of place is weaved from many threads, of which art is one. It's essential but not sufficient. What's so different about it is it can be done so much more quickly than anything else. So it can have a catalytic effect on the other threads. Um, to make fabric, you need a weaver. And the weaver, in local, first of all, all placemaking is local. Uh, a state is not a place. It's a collection of places. A county is not a place. It's a collection of places. And that means, um, if, you know, I'm a state bureaucrat. We can only work through... Uh, localities, local arts organizations and municipalities, and we're, we're really now requiring, first of all, all of our arts funding is only for placemaking. We don't give out arts money for anything other than placemaking. We said it's that important. And we require partnerships between art organizations and municipalities because we think that's the essential partnership, particularly if you're lucky enough to live in a city or town that has a visionary mayor or for selectmen, or even uh, a mayor who kind of gets it and a staff person or, or two that really get it. Those are your natural allies. Um, they're going to be the voice that uh, talks back to the arts institutions who aren't so keen on what we're doing. The, the bulk of arts funding has historically gone to big art. What we're talking about much more in creative placemaking is little art, arts entrepreneurs, and grassroots, much more community-connected folks, that tends to be threatening to the arts institutions. They'll try to push, push what we're doing back. You need the strong voices of the mayors as allies because they actually get what we're doing and how, what the power is of engaging, fully engaging the creatives in a community. It, it, it's, a, it's a transformative uh, uh, initiative, uh, unpredictable, uh, that's a challenge to evaluation because a lot of the best, best stuff is not only hard to measure, it's hard to predict. Um, and I would say, just by putting my two cents worth in, in closing on the evaluation topic, there was a comment in the session over there about how um, social impact needs to be considered equal to economic impact. And I would suggest that's a false dichotomy. The key economic impact is the social impact. And we need to not adopt the language of our enemies. <laughs> there was a comment earlier on that I frankly found condescending about artists' ability to count on their fingers. The, the mentality that is necessary to evaluate the impact of art on placemaking and to evaluate placemaking generally is not rules-based thinking. It's pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. It requires tapping into our full tacit knowledge. We walk around we, through life as icebergs with the things we're conscious of, what's above the surface, the bigger part of what we know that's not conscious to us is below the surface. You tap into that through the kind of pattern recognition skills that art develops. They develop in other ways. But artists fundamentally are better equipped to evaluate placemaking than rules-based thinkers are. And we've got to stop thinking that economic impact is about counting jobs. That's so insignificant. It's the impact that art has, along with other things, to make places magnets for the mobile talent that can choose to live anywhere. And if they choose to live in your place, then you're in the game and they help you build the next economy. It's the jobs that they will help you create not the jobs that you create through your actual artwork and the spending of your patrons. That's largely irrelevant. AFTA spends tons of money, and we are part of the studies, counting up the jobs. That is the tip of the iceberg of economic impact. The big impact is how we influence places. We measure it overall with one metric. 
Are we increasing our share of 25 to 34 year olds in our cities and towns? There's a lot of things that go into that, not just art, but that's the, that's the ultimate metric. Then on a project basis, you, you really can't isolate the influence of an in, a, a given project, not only because a number of things contribute to it, but they also contribute to it over time. It's not a single event. But you can, through discipline, get your grantees to be intentional. And we work with um, Wolf Brown to develop a, you know, a rather complex outcome matrix that forces our grantees to, in kind of an open book test, tell us what they're planning to do and tell us how they're planning to measure it. We're not dictating to them either their outcomes or their, their indicators, but they have to be intentional. And that is a paradigm shift because largely a lot of the work we do has not been intentional about its community impact. Just being intentional has a terrific uh, transformative impact. We're, we feel like we're in the beginning stages of figuring out how to measure this, how to be intentional effectively, and we're doing that in partnership with our grantees. We're not telling them this is how you do it. We think nobody really knows that. We're going to discover that with them. But just forcing them to be intentional is transformative in itself. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Kip. Len? Hi. Uh, yeah. He, you can applaud. That's fine. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my relationship with mayors. Um, I've worked for four mayors now, and soon there will be another one coming in. Um, I, I'm going to just step back for a second. Barnaby introduced me this morning um, in the context of a 25-year-old festival that we did when I first started working for the city. I started working in the Parks Department Office of Cultural Affairs in 1998. The Parks Department Office of Cultural Affairs was also grown out of a CETA program in the 70s. Um, in two, 2002, we had an election, um, and a new mayor was elected. And we had gone through um, quite, quite some turmoil in the city. Uh, the former mayor, um, Buddy Cianci, who was in office for, almost, for over 20 years, um, was convicted on RICO charges and on his way to federal prison and um, had been a very strong supporter of arts and culture in the city, had put legislation up at the state to start arts districts, had used arts and culture as a rallying cry for making the city a better place, invested um, in, in using government funds in, in water fire, um, and had also had some pretty controversial things done. And a development happened over in uh, the Valley neighborhood that was basically dislocating one of the most um, organic, thriving arts communities that was coming up in the city. Mostly they were staying from RISD, and it was the first time we had seen so many young people staying in the city, and it was a real uh, dramatic moment in, arts, in the arts community. And um, in response to that dislocation that was very, um, it was really hard. It really put a lot of people against each other. There's a lot of fighting, a lot of crying out. And um, in response to that, our artist community came to the mayor and said, we want to we start a project in that same area. That's going to be talked about in the next session, so I'm going to leave that for now. But what I will say is that moment in time really galvanized the arts community in the city. Um, and they put a lot of pressure on the incoming mayor to raise the level of the way that arts and culture was being cultivated within city government. There was a community planning process, and the result of that was to take the resources the Parks Department had, which were very few. We had two staff people getting paid a collective le collectively less than $100,000 a year and a $70,000 operating budget. Take those two people, the operating budget, and take a little grant money out of the mayor's office and start this department. The community had done a plan, was asking for seven people, a million dollar budget, and the city just didn't have the resources. So we found ourselves in a situation where we were trying to deliver on a political promise that the mayor had made, Mayor David Cicilline, to really cultivate arts and culture in the city in a meaningful, deep way from the policy level down to, uh, you know, across, just across the board. And uh, had to really think about how we were going to be able to do this. The city was used, the residents were used to our department in the Cultural Affairs Office producing arts festivals and events. We no longer, we were being told now to do policy work, and it was a real tumultuous time for us to try to figure it all out. 
And, I, and I'm very proud of the work that we did over the last 10 years because we really did figure it out and we really did start to look at all of the, all of the things that the community wanted to have happen. Um, Within that 10-year period, we also did a cultural plan that was very deep and into the community. We had over 2,000 people participate. And my deputy director, Stephanie Fortunato, is here, and she did the, the brunt of carrying the water on that work. And it was an incredible process. It also happened at a time when our mayor may have been running for another office. So we positioned it at a very critical time in the political season so that the community was, was reminded of the work that was happening. Um, after we did the cultural plan, uh, we really were able to put together, re we put together resources across city government. And even before that, we were able to start leveraging resources. So how do you serve an entire city with all of these different um, policy you know, points when you only have $70,000 and two people? It's almost impossible to do that with, with that kind of resource. So we started doing, we really started doing partnerships. We worked with partnerships to do more programming. We started partnering with the planning department to, to, to leverage resources through HUD and Community Development Block Grant. Um, and we started working with the community, and our planning department was really a very strong partner in that work at the time during, during the Cicilline administration. We worked with the Parks Department to leverage funding that they had to put um, performances all across the neighborhoods in all, of our, in all of our city parks that became incredible civic engagement opportunities for neighborhoods and neighborhood organizations to own arts and culture. Um, so um, just in terms of some of the other ways that we, re we leveraged the cultural plan was we had $300,000 come down through ARA uh, for workforce development and we funded 13 arts organizations to put over 300 kids to work that summer. Um, we've done tax stabilizations to help arts organizations uh, be able to finance their buildings. Um, we've, done, we've been the first ones in, the city's been the first ones in on major development in our downtown, particularly with AS220. Um, we just did another deal with Water Fire where we came up with $250,000 of HUD funds to put the first money into the building they just bought. The state then matched it, and then that leveraged a $650,000 EPA grant that's going to help clean that brownfields. The mayors have been involved every step of the way. They've been engaged. They understand the value. They see these projects building community in places where community had sort of gone away. Um, I think the best example is, is the, the one on Empire Street with AS220, where we had prostitution rings literally owning Empire Street, and now it is the hub of creativity, community building, and small businesses are thriving there because of that work. But I had an interesting experience with our last mayor, and he will, he will be the first to agree with me here, that he needed to be educated. He did not understand this work when he first was elected. He sat three weeks ago in New York City with the Bloomberg Foundation, the Atlantic, and the Aspen Institute being interviewed by Rocco Landisman about cultural investment because of the work that this community has done to educate him about the power of this work. He is now, uh, you know, he is now out there talking about it and, 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 and really understanding it because he sees the power of transforming community and transforming neighborhoods. So... Um, I think the, the takeaways from what I have to say are that it, it is everyone's job in this room to start an education process in their city um, around political leadership to educate them of the value of this work. I think mayors want to see their communities change. They want to see their communities grow and transform. And through the work that we've been doing with the community um, in the arts organizations here, in particular in the artists, we now have city council people coming to us and saying, what can you do for me? How can you help transform my neighborhood? They're now reaching into their own neighborhoods and asking the artists to help them. We've got a great example in the Avenue A concept. Yarrow Thorne's here. It's a new organization in the city, and he's been doing wonderful work with anti-graffiti. And our city council is now calling upon him to help solve problems. This is what we want to see. This is what creative placemaking is about. It's about artists solving problems in communities. So... Um, I want to leave room for a conversation, but those are just some of the wonderful things we've been able to do here in the last 10 years, and it's really been thrilling to be able to sit back and kind of think about it the last few weeks. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. So I'm Aaron Williams. I'm up in central Massachusetts, where my uh, title is 
Cultural Development Officer for the City of Worcester and the director of the Worcester Cultural Coalition. But I'm also an artist embedded in City Hall, and that's why I was really hired to be brought into the city to work with an old industrial community, very similar to Providence, very similar to the gateway cities in the Rust Belts across the nation and in Massachusetts. And it's really about looking at how we connect creativity into the life spring of the communities that we work in. And none of them are the same. The Cultural Coalition is somewhat unique in that it began in 1999 when this city of arts organizations and institutions were all knocking separately on a city manager's door. We have a strong city manager, not city mayor. And they were told to go and organize amongst themselves, which they had never done before. And they came up with a strategy of what they considered to be a, an agenda for the city, looking at arts education, how arts were woven into the fabric of the way the city looked, how we supported our artists, how we really encouraged cross collaborations with our new immigrant communities. And they began to work and talk together in a way they never had before. Fortunately, our state arts agency understood this. In 1995, a woman by the name of Beata Becker looked at this program that the MCC had called the Local Cultural Council Grant Program, where every community in the state receives funding where a group of volunteers gives money back for creative activity. They said, let's build on this program and that's where the Adams Arts Program was born. It was called Cultural Development Grant Program in 1999. It was the forerunner for the Our Town Program and many other arts placemaking initiatives. And what it was asking people to do is something that Marty was talking about earlier, and that's to begin to listen, to actively listen to what the needs are in any constituency, any group that's gathered together to solve a problem or to, uh, to affect change. And for those who don't understand the language, part of the job of a cultural person in my position is to translate that language. So it might be my taking a city councilor or a business leader to an event that they might be intimidated by. Or it might be about inciting an artist to address a problem like how do we solve crime in a very underserved neighborhood in our community? And to bring people around the table together to solve that. What's unique about this cultural coalition is they levied themselves, they worked with the state of Massachusetts through that Adams Arts Program initiative I mentioned, and they forged a partnership where they created a position where they said they would raise an operating budget and salary and put this person in City Hall but not in an arts and culture office. It would be enveloped and developed in the development office. So that's where it resides today. And this position allows for things like Lynn was talking about, to be at the table when we're talking about streetscape improvements. We're putting a new wayfinding system in place, and it will include public art in 25 locations throughout the city. It allowed for us to create what we call the Woo Card. And the Woo Card was an outgrowth of 32,000 college students in a city like Worcester, where you don't think of college and higher ed, and to actively engage them through wooing activities. This fond Woo Card now has over 8,000 wooies, student wooies, <laughs> where we have Woo buses taking them from their campuses out to an experience, it might be a hip hop concert in the Egyptian room at the art museum at 10 o'clock at night. It allows for that creative engagement where they can tell their stories and be involved in placemaking for their city. This partnership is unique in the fact that it cannot be dictated to by the purviews of politics. It's a partnership between the city and the organizations. And now there are 78 organizations, over 1,500 people employed by them. 
and 35 creative businesses who are all working together to what we call the Wu way. Mm -hmm. And it's an, a manifesto about creativity and nurturing it anytime, any place, anywhere. And the benchmark there is that active engagement and seeing people participating in some of those experiences. So I'm going to cut it short there, and we'll have much more room for dialogue about drilling down into the actual work itself. So my name oh, is Gungun KM. I'm the Director of Arts, Culture, Creative Economy for the City of Minneapolis. And my story is, is a little bit different uh, than my colleagues here. Um, my story is about being a brand new element in the city of Minneapolis. So the city of Minneapolis has, the Minneapolis has a wonderful creative community that goes w without saying we have a, a great um, foundation community. Philanthropy does well in Minneapolis. We have a great organizations of all scales, large, medium-sized, small, individual artists thrive in our city. And yet the city government, um, the city itself, the enterprise, um, doesn't have a people in the city that work focused on arts and culture. Um, one, uh, that isn't actually true. There's one person, uh, Mary Altman, who um, runs the public art program and has been running it for since 2000. Um, my entry into the city was actually uh, predicated by a, a plan that was done with the Minneapolis Arts Commission, which is essentially a citizen body that advises the city council. Uh, the Minneapolis Arts Commission developed a plan for arts and culture. And um, in that plan, switching out, yes. in that plan, um, they called for the development of a director of arts. And that was when I came to the city in, tw in 2011. Um, when I arrived, I ha I, it was just me. I had no budget and no staff. So, touche. <laughs> and, um, and when I arrived, I was told to keep my head down because it was budgeting process. It was, we were going through budgeting, and I was not to be paid attention to because if I was to stick my head up too far, it might get chopped off by the political debate. So I was kept quiet for a while, and um, in that quiet, I actually began to survey to see what is here in the city, what do I have to work with, and I quickly found out uh, in meeting with council members and the mayor that I actually had some perceptions of art and, and artistic activities that were very subjective. And those subjective experiences were leading how these, uh, these elected officials were then supporting or not supporting arts organizations. And my first thought was I need to change the subjectivity so that we can become more objective and agree on what arts and culture bring to the table other than our personal good or bad experiences. So that's where uh, the Minneapolis Creative Index came in. And I bring it into the room simply as a work product that has been done over the last couple of years that has actually helped us build capacity within the city to allow other creative placemaking strategies to happen. Because I came uh, with no budget, and now I have a budget to work with. And I'm actually working not just with my budget that I requested this year, but also with the budgets of other departments. So backing up a little bit, um, the way I've worked with no budget and no staff is I work laterally. I build partnerships with departments, and I build partnerships with outside institutions. And we together build a project or a, or a program. And um, often my, uh, my aim is to both build capacity within the community as well as within the city. It's a two-fold process. Because there had been no capacity building in the past to help elected officials understand the power of this work and the impact of this work, I'm trying to educate them. Um, we have a weak mayoral system, so our council is strong. And it's really important that they uniformly understand and value and approve of the way that, that you know, I want to work. So the Minneapolis Creative Index was designed to be essentially a, um, it's a, it's a tool that, that talks about jobs. I'm sorry, we, we, have some, we have some quantitative measures here. But it also helps uh, us describe the values that we have in the city for creative placemaking. And it brings us all to the table. It's a, it's a measure that allows us to track information over time. And it also allows us to have a baseline to look at changes in the community. And this was the first um, 
a report of its kind that the city did, and it was really tailored to our audiences, and our audiences being elected officials and the creative community. Um, uh, this page in particular was, was uh, requested by electeds themselves because they didn't want to read. They wanted to look at the data on one page. So I literally I gave them a page that, that they could work with, and it's been very useful. Um, it has interesting information, and we also um, brought that information down to the ward level so they could see uh, the impacts on their ward because most of the information I could get before this was on the, on the metropolitan statistical area, and I could not bring that down to the ward level to help them make those decisions. And then we also added inf information about consumer spending and, um, you know, capacity, revenues in the uh, nonprofit community. We basically worked with data from Westaf, their index called the Creative Vitality Index, but we didn't want to put vitality in our title because we felt that, that that word was contentious and we needed to bring that issue up. And so we, we did what we felt that the, and what the elected officials told, told us was important, but we also put our values on the table which is discuss the, the role of my position, which is building social and economic impact for the, excuse me, capital for the city of Minneapolis. And the way we build that, we describe the role of artists in the development of social and economic capital. And, so, and what then went on to talk about the case studies. So it's a very thin report, but it actually is a very practical report. It's meant to be read, it's meant to be engaged with, and it's meant to be used. Um, as far as uses are concerned, we found that elected officials are taking them to business association meetings and handing them to uh, departments um, like um, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development are using it with their business associations. Um, I found that educational institutions are using it for recruitment in departments of art. Um, so they're actually uh, giving it to students, which is great news because now we're talking about young, young people coming to the city. Um, I'm also finding that it was used in the most recent design um, competition for Nicolette Mall, which is a main thoroughfare in the city, and they're quoting the data in their design. So it's, it's meant to be a broad tool, and it's, it's being utilized. So we're learning more, and now I have a budget to continue to develop this. But uh, again, want to point out that I'm starting at a point of just practicality. What can I do with donated? This, this actually was, the design was donated. Um, with very little money and with uh, trying to get elected officials on board. One other project I want to focus on and then move on um, is the Creative City Making Project, which is our Art Place project, funded project. And this is an example of the kind of partnership that I build to, to um, build capacity both internally and externally within the city. And this project is with Intermedia Arts. <coughs> Intermedia has a cross-sector training program called um, the Creative Community Leadership Institute. And I wanted to utilize that program to train, train both city staff and artists to work together. And we decided that we were going to work with the Department of Planning. And there's some information on your table about that project. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but one of the goals of that project was to create a laboratory so that we can develop a program that can be applied to all departments in the city. And rather than having Jack's experience of being handed a table and a computer for artists, I wanted artists to be involved in work that departments needed, work that they needed innovation around. And in the Department of Planning, they really needed help engaging with the community so that we changed the paradigm of community engagement and data gathering being through meetings and made them into act arts-based activities. And that actually happened. We actually had the entire work plan for the year uh, of the Department of Long Range Planning, uh, working on transit corridors, working in small area plans, working on historic capstone studies, this is the team. We had teams of artists work with teams of planners. And alongside that, we also had a, we, a convenings tailored specific for, specifically for these groups where we could learn more about each other away from the intensity of the work. Um, and these are, the, these are the four teams here, but there were five city plans. Um, and then the work that this, this represents some of the work that the artists did to gather data around all these projects, similar to the work that Candy Chang does, placing things in public spaces, working in festivals, um, 
prototyping ideas for plans so that people can really engage with the actual data rather than uh, assumptions and handing people the capacity to engage right in the places that they are at rather than in meetings. And then um, we're sharing that information in the forum in November 22nd. But essentially, what there were some explicit goals, but also some implicit goals, or some goals that I was hiding. <laughs> so anyone who went to Covert Girls, thank you. Anyone who went to Marty's session knows about that conversation. But the Covert Goal was to create an on-ramp for individual artists to enter into city work around work that the city needs that engages in innovative uh, activities. So now we're talking about expanding this into other departments and we're asking departments to also pay for that. So we've invested in one year in planning, we want to move on and planning wants to keep some of this and they're going to be uh, looking at putting these artists into their budgets now and we're helping that conversation happen. So just so one particular project and I'm going to leave it at that and let you ask me questions later. Thank you, Gilgan. We can get that PowerPoint if we want it, apparently. So I'm still Marty Pottinger, and <laughs> perhaps my greatest mistake was no, no. Um, my, my, thought, <laughs> my thought in starting Art at Work, uh, which has been happening in uh, Portland, Maine since 2007, uh, and now in Holyoke, Massachusetts, um, uh, since uh, 2012, was that cities were going to have to shoulder uh, pretty much the almost the entire burden or a large chunk of it for seeing us through the next several decades and actually coming up uh, with the kind uh, solutions. What I say about one part, the solutions, the size of the problems or the challenges. Um, and from being a theater artist for years, I had the chance to learn and have audiences teach me the tremendous transformative wallop uh, and proving ground that art offers. And so my work is focused within the city. I'm on staff. You're welcome to come visit uh, in City Hall. And it's my plan has been to figure out ways that city workers and community leaders and members can actually make art themselves as a way of moving things forward. And so specific challenges are identified, such as low police morale, uh, high incident of discrimination lawsuits within the public service department, um, kind of culture of disrespect for the least paid uh, healthcare staff workers at a city-owned facility, um, and design an arts project and build a, a community and engagement with the local professional artists and do the project. I've learned several things. Um, there's a very robust website, artatwork.us, that you're welcome to visit and explore with lots of information and videos. But here right now among us, since everyone here, uh, I thought it just might be nice to briefly talk about some of the things I think I know. Uh, and one is how scary it is for people to make art, that it's, uh, for the most part, taking it to non, people who don't identify as artists, has uh, the, the, it's like a, uh, telling the, the city leaders in Portland, Maine, giving them and the community leaders in one project called Portland Works, giving everyone seven minutes to write a poem, uh, picking a time from Portland in the Ice Age till now historical, you could just feel the tensions rise and in the end of seven minutes uh, you got the payback as if everyone had just completed a seven week outward bound course. <laughs> it was that big of a risk and it was that big of a reward. People were able to bond, they were able to reach for something, they were able to kind of contradict everything and that's obviously inside each of us but doesn't get tapped so directly in actual art making. Um, Another thing is uh, identifying uh, a lot of the leadership in our communities is uh, invisible. A lot of the things, the places and the people who actually, well, not the places, the people who actually make things happen aren't in official positions of authority. And so uh, something that I learned early on in terms of developing a year-long relationship with the police department uh, 
before they wrote a poem was anyone wrote any poem. Uh, and then they wrote their first poem at roll call, which was um, by Sergeant Hayden, the memorable, my first roll call I ever attended. Uh, the sky is blue, my uniform's blue, my cruiser's blue, my balls are blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sergeant Hayden. <laughs> excellent, excellent, uh, good start. Um, but what I did was ask officers throughout the command staff, who do you look to, just in private one-on-one, -on -one, who do you look to, who do you respect, if you have a problem, who do you go to? And then you'll start hearing, who do people actually go to, who do people actually look to already in that culture, in that community? And start, I mean, I think it just helps to identify them in terms of winning allies and getting support. The man, the officer, was a lieutenant then. Uh, this is 2007. He's now the police chief in Portland. And uh, I said, who knew, Mikey, you'd ride the poetry stallion all the way to chiefdom? <laughs> um, uh, so leadership, I think, is key in terms of identifying uh, who that is and building those relationships. I think relationships are really the heart of it. And I, my work in Portland and in Holyoke is much more focused on relationship, building kind of the infrastructure uh, of that as what is going to kind of see us through is where uh, you're going to, it's going to make the, enough of a, a difference to better the odds that we will come up with those kinds of unexpected and previously unimagined solutions. Um, of high quality. I think the quality of the materials, I think it's really two, two things about keep the bar high. One is I think in terms of the art that's being generated, uh, Laura and I have had some great discussions about uh, what do you do and about uh, the quality. And I think everyone has a different level of quality, but I think it's important for us as practitioners to have high expectations, not of necessarily this person's gonna, quality is gonna be this person's, but for that person. So the chief of police um, the second year agreed, another fellow agreed to write a poem and uh, Lieutenant Soschuk uh, walked in and he said, the chief said, I'm done. And Mike said, we're done. He goes, I finished the poem last night. And Mike said, you finished the poem last night. Hmm. Joe's, yep. He goes, Mike goes, you have no idea what's coming. And so the chief had to go back and revise it several times. And it was my, you know, at my request, at my figuring out how to do that. But that's the process that really, I think, lends not only legitimacy, but actually um, a credibility for the whole project. Um, and then uh, the quality of the materials that we present, I think, are very important. And the last thing I'll say uh, that comes to mind is in evaluation, I think it's possible. I worked with Chris Dwyer from RMC Research. She's in Portsmouth mostly and uh, doing a lot of kind of detailed work, thanks to Animating Democracy um, assistance, uh, figuring out evaluation methods. and. I think it needs to be brought in right from the start, an evaluation mindset, and to actually design projects and train your staff and train yourself and train your community to think evalu evaluatively. Maybe not say it well, but think evaluatively. And, uh, and the, a good example of that is uh, this police poetry calendar was to uh, raise morale among the officers. and. All the things I just told you happened, and they all made a difference, but the project's goals were definitely n not reached to the level they ended up until the evaluation period, which in that case was designed to be one-on-one -on -one interviews where the officers were listened to and asked very, you know, substantive questions about the impact on them of doing the poetry and what was the impact on your family and did you take it home and show it to your family? And, you know, we mailed the calendar to their families because we knew they wouldn't take it home. Uh, so we mailed, you know, 260 copies to the homes because we knew it would be in everyone's trunk otherwise. <laughs> um, so you need to know your culture. But it was during those interviews where they were being listened to and asked those sorts of questions that you could see the impacts and the outcomes start landing about morale, about being respected, about their connection to each other. And uh, so good. Wow. Thanks. That's, that's great. Wow, that's just a lot to absorb. Uh, lots of great takeaways. And uh, 
to begin the conversation among ourselves. I don't want to just be the one asking the questions and asking for somebody to answer. I just want to kick this off and then hopefully turn it into you all asking questions of each other and then very quickly turn it into an opportunity for any of you to join in. And it, is there still a mic that can float around? Yes. Yep. Great. So I'm going to ask that you raise your hand if you know you want to ask a question or add a comment and keep it really brief so that we can keep as many people involved in this conversation as possible. And whoever's running the mic around will go from hand to hand, OK? So I heard a lot of talk about uh, uh, the idea of uh, educating leaders, having artists at the table, listening. I love, I love the, the phrase, know your culture. Boy, that, if we could all just go home and practice that, I think we'd be doing great. Uh, the value of having tools that you can use, but also developing tools other people can use and knowing who needs what kind of tools. Gogan, your point about what do these leaders who are really in charge here need in order for them to feel they can be objective about making a case with just a simple tool in their hand. If they have that, they feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And how do artists who seem to be moving much more out of the studio into city halls and at the tables of community organizations. I mean, I just see this as a sweeping cultural revolution that's happening. Where are they getting the educational support? So when they get out of school, the idea of going and working in the ways that we've been talking about here don't seem that absurd or out of the norm. So one of my big challenges that I get to when I think about this has been an issue for me for a long time you know, the artists wanting to work in the public realm, they are not getting it in their formal educational system. They're learning on the job as soon as they get out and realize there are these other avenues. So if, if we could just, anybody want to respond to, is there a way through all the work that we're talking about in terms of policies, in terms of uh, past to success support systems, the phases of processes and partnerships, yeah, just a couple of things. One, um, we now require for every one of our arts grants that at least one artist be involved in the planning or execution. Now, it, it seems kind of ridiculous that you even have to require that, but uh, a, a lot of arts grants that are given out by states, there is no artist in the mix. It's just a very strange thing. Even, you know, we're not talking about artists and residents in city and state governments. We're talking about regular arts grants. Um, yeah, I think there's some indoctrination to the culture of uh, government. Um, I, I, I find, um, having worked in and out of government for whatever, 40 years, um, I'm still being indoctrinated. Um, I'm not sure I still understand that culture or that I necessarily want to. But I, I think um, artists bring something to it. It's not just that they need training and how to deal with um, bureaucracies and the like. And they certainly need training in how to be better business people, and we're doing a lot of that. But what they bring is a different way of thinking. They have a nonlinear way of thinking, and we live in a nonlinear world. All of our problems are nonlinear. Planning, city planning as, as it's been practiced, is a linear profession. And they are coming up with the wrong solutions because they don't think the right way. So there's something fundamental to most artists that they bring to the equation. They may need, you know, they may need a little bit of training on how to communicate that, how to integrate that thinking into the context that they're working in, but they bring something incredibly important that's missing to the places that they're, they're going, in my view. Can yeah. I jump in? I, yeah. oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. So this aspect of training, I think, is really important because, um, as I mentioned, we had we have a public art administrator in the city of Minneapolis f for 13 years, and that hadn't changed anything in terms of our internal culture because the internal culture was seeing art as an object. And I see art as a process, and an object is part of that process. And um, what the effort behind the work we were trying to do, or are trying to do, is to 
bring it more into the culture of the city. So the city aligns better with what the creative sector has to offer. And sometimes it's not a thing. Sometimes it's a way of thinking or it's innovation or it's an adjustment. And sometimes it's things too. But um, so, so that was, that's at the crux of the efforts that we're trying to do. I'm not, I, I'm not foolish enough to think it's the only solution. But w one word that I came across immediately when I arrived in the city was risk. The risk of um, having a stand for film, let's say, because I had people coming to me constantly saying, please, now you're here, talk about this, talk about that. And I couldn't because every time I did, and I was talking about jobs, elected officials were hearing art. Yeah. No, we can't, we can't support that because it means art. And I'd say, no, it's jobs. <laughs> and yet, you know, so... So that, how do we help a risk-averse environment, which is city government and politics, uh, embrace this very highly risky activity? What can we give them? Uh, what tools or pieces can we give them to utilize in talking points, in media? We just had a mayoral of election in, in the city, and it was, you know, this, this was brought out, mm -hmm. this issue. So can I, can I um, just follow up with a sort of more, tan like a very tangible example? Um, uh, I think the, the whole notion of risk and understanding what risk is all about is, is sort of what's been successful in Providence, that elected officials said to people, are you insane? You want to light the river on fire? Um, what? But said, that sounds like we should try it because we don't have anything to lose here. You know, we had fallen down so deeply low at that point in time that the mayor was like, let's make it happen, you know? So I think that that's been a sort of ongoing narrative around the work that we've been doing in city government um, to the point that anyone who comes into my office, and I am, I am the risk translator for the city of Providence. I, the artists come to me and say, I have an idea. I'd like to do this. And then I help no negotiate and navigate how to get it done. And it is only presented to the elected officials once it's, we're at the point where we can unveil it, show it demonstrate the success of it. And so I think that's been a very, maybe not a conscious effort, but it's been a, something that's really worked. And then, and then secondly, in terms of training, um, we, we, were, we received a, a, an Our Town grant in 2011 that was a, a very significant grant from the NEA and did it and had 18 partners across the city, some of them arts organizations, some of them business organizations. But one of our partners was Rhode Island School of Design. And what we did was we worked with a class there and we, we mentored 15 young people to do public art projects in the public realm and handheld them through all of it so that now they are they do have that background and that training and I see that as something that is incredibly valuable um, to the field and those out of those kids I don't know the numbers exactly but we know some of them stayed in the city because they had that engagement with the city mm -hmm. and they had that engagement with this creative with the creative placemaking work so um, just a tangible example yeah. of that um, I wonder Lynn if you have any data for our city, actually, as to how many artists we're retaining in the city upon graduation from RISD, from Brown, from Johnson and Wales, and or do we, could you tell us what incentives the city and state are providing artists by way of real estate, studio space, tax incentives um, that could attract this, I love that, this next generation of uh, jobs makers, business makers. Um, the, the higher ed, uh, the League of Higher Education, uh, the folks who count the numbers have numbers, but there's no specific data on artists staying in the city. Um, we have not been investing in data collection. It's not something we've had the money to do. So um, unfortunately, uh, we also have little opportunity outside city government to even go for that kind of funding locally. So. My, Stephanie's the, the data person in my office, and she'll tell you that we just don't have that stuff. You know, we've got, we've got basic things, but we've, we've been doing a lot more mapping and, and sort of figuring out where artists are and where they live and things like that and how they're affecting community, but we don't have actual numbers. So I am not, I am not, I am so um, out of, uh, and I'm, just, I'm not the data person in this group at all. <laughs> I'm talk, we, what we're talking about is vitality and changing communities, and, and I... I measure that through my mayors. So when you're, when you're working as closely with elected officials as we do in my department, 
they, they don't want the data. They want to know what's going to happen a, a year from now. They've got four years to make something happen. They want, they want data, but they don't want it. We just haven't been able to do it at that level. So I'm sorry I'm sort of going Neh, to everything. But, 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 but no, tax incentives, I mean, the state of Rhode Island just um, took the legislation from 1998 that created ta tax districts for artists so that we're, if you were making and selling work in a district, um, there was no sales okay. tax. We just, the, the state legislature just made the entire state of Rhode Island tax-free for buying, for, for purchasing art. So that's kind of a big deal. Randy, you know, had a big role in that. Um, but we don't, we don't have tax incentives. We, we're talking about the sense, you know, we, what we're doing is cultivating community. We're cultivating organizations that build community, that give artists opportunity. And so that's where we've focused. We focus on making sure that Water Fire is going to have this amazing space so that they can then go and cultivate that community on Valley and bring jobs into that space and build educational opportunities for the youth that live in that neighborhood. We've invested in helping the Steelyard move things along so that they can build a community. We've invested in AS220 heavily so that they can put three buildings online so that they can do the work of keeping the artists here. I'm not so sure it's the government's role to do that. Hey, okay, I have Len, a question. Le, uh, we have one more question over here. Could you pass right. the mic? Yeah, I want to be uh, quick. It's not a question, it's a comment about the situation in, specifically in Rhode Island, uh, talking about the government and art. Government and art in Rhode Island, especially for the diverse, for the diverse groups, uh, working in two different ways. Uh, the government concentrate uh, all big activities in the downtown. The uh, peripheric, like to Blaston Valley, where I live for 26 years, we have been not affected by the water fire. One of the cases. Another case is uh, the for first works, and another activities are concentrated in Providence, capital creative city. Uh, I love that because I have an office over here in Providence, but I live in Blaston Valley. Our communities are very abandoned for the all art and government in Rhode Island. I love and appreciate the new uh, loves for no tax. Maybe that can help to create the new district, art district in Blackstone Valley, the near the river, Blackstone River, uh, with the uh, tourist uh, council, Blackstone Valley Tourist and Council. But I say is in general, in 26 years living in here as an artist, I am a painter, art teacher, and I do art in Blackstone Valley. I try to in, in put the, the, all my activities into the Providence and also bring Providence, for example, for the, the Rizdi Museum. I invited a Rizdi Museum to bring the mobile museum to Blaston Valley. It's just in papers, nobody doing. We try to uh, use, for example, the student to come in to do internships into those neighborhoods. They feel afraid to stop by Central Falls. So I think we did it, set up many things. We have very, th very good things done already for the last 15, 20 years in Providence. We enjoy the World of Fire. We enjoy everything here. But I told last night to uh, the founder of World of Fire, please close, cross the river, Blaston River, get wet a little bit, and go into the northern neighborhoods and bring these activities out the city a little bit. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, all right, why don't we go here and then back? It'll be a little faster. Hello, my name is Maria Rodriguez Winter, and I'm here from Toledo, Ohio, the Sofia Quintero Art and Cultural Center. And my question had to do with uh, the growing population of Hispanics in the United States. And I guess evidence here, 39%, the majority. And I wanted to find out how you have been involved in, in the Latino community to be able to bring the art and the art in placemaking um, and how familiar you are with the culture. Because I heard that say, know your culture. So if you could share that with me, I'd appreciate it. Are you asking it. a specific question for Lynn? Can I? Whoever, uh, because the population is growing in Oops. the entire United States. And I'm sure every one of your, your locations will probably have pockets of newer immigrants. Immigrants that have come in have uh, the years. I have a, OK, we have time for just a quick response. And then yeah. we're going to get one in, more in question. In Holyoke, thank you. And in Holyoke, uh, the Latinos, Latino population is 42%. And uh, I think basically you make sure that the advisory team, the neighborhood leaders, that you're doing the outreach that needs to happen and that uh, translators, if not, you know, that you're clearing that and figuring out how to, uh, where it needs to happen and where it doesn't. And uh, I think it's a really great 
question. It's a really important issue. Um, uh, we're going to start an Indiegogo campaign, and part of it is in Spanish, and that statistic is out there. And uh, the participants in the workshops reflect the community. So I have a quick response. Um, uh, for, so in our creative city making program, the, one of the reasons the artists got into the pro, to work with planners is because planners are not seeing communities walk through the door for the data gathering part of city planning. And th those communities are typically underserved communities, racially diverse communities, and for various reasons, that, that, that's why they're not coming. So it's really targeted at walking outside of the door, going to where the communities are. So we've been to festivals, we've been to at bus stops, uh, we've been along businesses, along those particular transit corridors. So I can't give you data because we're actually gathering the data right now on the demographics. But it really is targeted towards underserved communities, especially in city planning processes. Yeah. So that, that's one way in which we've targeted uh, demographics in our work. And, and, and I, someone I just, back, I, I, there's someone. Oh, can I just yeah. follow up? Because I, I just want to address the Providence piece of that because I think, you know, one of the things that we did um, during the cultural planning process was we weren't getting the voices we needed. So we redesigned our plan to make sure that we were doing focus groups that were community led and really reached deeply into the community on some of that stuff. We just did a sustainable communities corridor program with um, mapping arts and cultural opportunities along all of five of our transit corridors and reach deeply into the community to get those voices to make sure that we were getting all of that stuff mapped. And next week we're actually hosting a meeting and I would encourage you to come to the meeting if you haven't been invited yet um, to think about how we build more capacity for our smaller cultural organizations in our downtown and in our neighborhoods and we're hosting that at AS220 because we see it as, a, as a, something that needs a lot more cultivation. So. Um, I think there's a, there's a conscious effort. And just for those of you who don't know, our mayor is Dominican. I mean, he's, he grew up in Providence. He's, a, he's from the Dominican Republic, and it's our first Latino mayor. So there's, um, you know, there's, it's representative of, of the population here that we have a Dominican mayor. So. OK, we're down to our, our last comment or question. I see the microphone is over here. I'm sorry for those that uh, wanted to participate, but I want to say afterwards, we are available throughout the conference and really invite the dialogue to continue with you directly and among yourselves. Yeah, my question has directly to do with jobs and evaluating quality. And I was really uh, interested in a number of the things you said in our city. That's what they want to know is, you know, does it create jobs? This seems to be a really big issue. And yet that's not an issue that I'm necessarily wanting to address um, personally. Uh, and. I'm Russ Rubert. Uh, I'm the artist and art director for Idea X Factory in Springfield, Missouri. Our city is a little bit smaller, but not much than Providence. And uh, actually, I've been amazed at how it's grown because uh, I was on the ISC committee that brought this sculpture conference to com be part of the convergence. And so I come back, and now Providence is like this amazing circle of energy, really. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, but in our own situation is we're trying, we're a contemporary uh, art space for installation. And, um, you know, so we're, we're really interested in installations and yet uh, some of our artists, um, you know, it's really, what I want to do is bring out the quality of the artist, the quality of the ins installation to really make that happen. What the city wants to see is, well, how does this create jobs? And I, we're on two different complete playing fields. And so that's what I want to try to uh, address, just that uh, you know, evaluation process. And, and I think um, the, the typical response is to count the jobs that you're creating in that work. And if you're a performing arts organization, the, the spending of your patrons, and then you know, speak back to the job counters that, well, here's the jobs. And it, what I'm, I'm not arguing against job impact. I'm just arguing against that very narrow definition of job impact. Because in the quality of what you do and how that impacts your town and makes it a more distinctive and interesting place, there is greater job impact than the jobs of creating that work and the folks paying to see it. And so we're just, um, jobs is actually the right measure, but not just the jobs of the artist in the 
creation of the work and the spending by their patrons, but what that work does to make the place attractive that brings the talent in that actually creates the whole next economy. And I would say to these folks that are risk averse, the riskiest thing you can do is to not invest in art when everyone else is, because your place is going to be passed by. You are engaging in ultra risky behavior by not making your place art infused when other places are. Because people have choice and they will go to the art infused places. So it's a very risky strategy not to embrace the arts. It's a very risky economic development strategy not to embrace the arts.